Um, so welcome guys. Today uh, we are going to do um, kind of a discovery, but also some hands-on, some practical look. Um, we have Kai Hutchison here, um, who is a global educator um, out of Saskatchewan, um, has a, a company called the Massive Corporation for Game Studio out of Regina, Saskatchewan. He was also a KCJ instructor at one point and an author. Um, and we are going to raffle out a couple of his books today um, at the end. So stay tuned for the end and we'll raffle a book for you. Um, we, we got them at the office and they're great, really uh, helpful. And we're really going to look at today connections to curriculum. So how can I integrate Scratch into the curriculum so that I'm doing what I need to do in class, yet I'm helping engage the students using a really cool tool that is readily available to everyone. Um, and this is, we're gonna look at elementary today. So kind of the beginning steps um, and types of things that we could do inside an elementary school classroom. Kai, I think that's where I am gonna pass the baton on uh, your way. So um, enjoy the session guys. and. Uh, be sure to hang out till the end and we'll uh, we'll do that raffle off as well. So thanks for uh, joining us, everybody. Um, so we'll uh, get started here. There's a link in the chat. Hopefully everybody got that uh, of the presentation. Um, so there's links embedded in there that uh, you'll want to put to good use. Um, so we can uh, you can follow along with the presentation there. And if you do have a Scratch account, which hopefully you do, uh, you can uh, make sure you're logged into Scratch uh, so that as we work together on some coding later in the presentation, uh, we can make sure that, you know, whatever you're working on uh, gets saved uh, to your account. So, um, I'll get started here. And so thank you to coming to the Curricular Connections with Scratch Elementary Workshop uh, here with Learn Quebec. Um, so number one, who the heck am I? Uh, I'm CEO of Massive Corporation Game Studio here in Saskatchewan. My name is Kai Hutchins. Uh, I'm also author of the Teacher's Guide to Scratch book series, which is uh, three books uh, published with Routledge uh, just earlier this year. Uh, and as well, I've put out a uh, online course as well, uh, the Teacher's Guide to Scratch online course, uh, which is 40 hours of video instruction on how to not just master scratch skills yourself, but how to integrate them into your classroom. So tips on um, pedagogy and grading and everything like that. So it really covers the whole gamut of how to incorporate scratch into your classrooms. Now, why would you need scratch? Well, number one is pretty much everywhere in North America now has some kind of mandate uh, to incorporate coding into classrooms. Uh, depends where you go. Uh, different districts may uh, handle that a little differently. Uh, different provinces have taken very different approaches. Um, so if you do bounce around uh, to different provinces, you can end up with completely different uh, requirements, um, which for somebody like me who bounces around to every school district in the country, uh, really keeps you on your toes, uh, what the heck you need to do and how to help people do it. Um, but number one, it's probably been mandated as part of your job in some way, shape or form. Um, but even if it wasn't, I would really strongly recommend every teacher get involved with Scratch anyways, even if it hasn't hit you. Uh, the fact is Scratch is an actually amazing teaching tool and you will be better off for incorporating it, whether you have to or not. Uh, so Scratch is thankfully the most accessible coding platform I've ever seen. Uh, it's very friendly, very uh, child-friendly, uh, really well-designed, has amazing language support, 
um, has really thoughtful design about how it works. So it just makes it a wonderful tool uh, to work with and really engaging and friendly to kids, which is great in any tool. So uh, it's incredibly versatile. You can do all kinds of different things. And so, you know, that's really what this workshops is about and making sure we go and poke all the different corners of uh, its potentials of helping you teach different curriculum uh, in different subjects. It has amazing support. Uh, MIT uh, is where Scratch developed and MIT is very committed to supporting it, making sure it's always free, always accessible. Um, and both Harvard and MIT have basically permanent staff working to ensure that Scratch is supported and available and there for teachers and kids. Uh, so enormous amount of support um, that, you know, we can rely on it more than you can, you know, given corporate uh, commercial interests uh, in coding, which, you know, if they don't hit their target numbers, they may have to withdraw support or change how they work in the market and all that. So Scratch is just a heck of a lot better place uh, to really center your coding practice uh, because of that. Uh, and very importantly, Scratch is wonderful for learning. And as today we're going to see, it's not just about coding. The whole purpose of, of what I try and do is, you know, while I am professionally a programmer, I've, I've worn that hat. I don't actually generally think of myself as a programmer. I prefer doing other things. The point is, we code for a purpose. We don't code just to code. We code to achieve things. Coding is just a tool for us to do other stuff, whether that's you know, run spreadsheets so we can keep track of our money in a business, or whether it's, in today's case, uh, learning to make animated poetry so that we can do self-expression better. Uh, it's it's a tool. It, we can do whatever we want with it, and that's the point. Coding is just a tool set you can add to your teaching practice. So. Today, we're really going to focus on cross-curriculars because, of course, there is no extra time in the day. When we go and get mandates from government to teach something new, they rarely come with something getting taken off your plate. It's always just being added to and added to and added to. And so, boy, if we don't take a cross-curricular approach with coding, when are we going to find the time to actually achieve it? Now, the great news is we can do a heck of a lot of cross-curricular stuff, which then means we can be learning code and teaching code while subject-wise, theme-wise, we talk about biology or history or whatever it is. And so we can make sure we combine those two things. And by doing that, we're not just saving time, but we're reinforcing to our students that there is a point to all of this. <laughs> the reason you want to know why an if statement works is because you want to make a cool program that's going to do cool stuff and teach things and show things. And that's really what you want to do. And so we can incorporate that coding right purposefully into meaningful context and, and provide intrinsic motivation to do this stuff. So we get to investigate learning at these higher levels with deeper meaning and, and more interest and, and all kinds of different topics. So this is going to let us do, you know, development learning and play-based learning because whatever we create, of course, we can then interact with as well, which is one of the great things about Scratch is we're going to make something that does stuff and we can either watch it or play it or whatever. And so again, it just builds that intrinsic motivation. We get to create stuff that does stuff and we can interact with it and we can show it to our friends and it just makes it all so wonderfully delightful. So 
when we are working with Scratch, there are a lot of different ways that we can actually use it in our classrooms. The obvious thing is, of course, direct instruction, just walking your students through how to build something. And that's essentially what I'm going to be doing later in this presentation. I'm going to walk you through building some specific things. It's often, uh, you know, kind of, mm, I won't say, you know, uh, There's a certain amount of not positive opinions about direct instruction that, you know, we always want to do inquiry based and, and all that. But uh, the real reality of it is coding is not obvious and just poking it with a stick uh, is not necessarily going to get you the results that you necessarily want to get. And direct instruction really is a important part of coding to help students realize things that are not horribly obvious you know they will find the sound effects buttons and they will learn how to click those very quickly uh but really understanding the nuance of an if statement may not entirely become obvious to them uh themselves so we always want to start centered understanding direct instruction really is an important part of teaching uh, but we can expand way beyond that, and coding is a really wonderful place for inquiry-based inquiry learning uh, and for student-led projects. And so we can look at other ways we can use Scratch, like providing challenges um, to provide them starter projects that they can then either follow along like we are today, or that they can twist and turn and remix and develop into their own thing. Uh, you can use Scratch not for coding. You can just find finished projects in Scratch and provide them to your students to demonstrate concepts, to allow them to play with concepts. They don't have to build everything that you use in Scratch. Uh, and that can be really useful for you know some fairly complicated things. You might want to show kids that this concept exists and it can be seen in action, but they don't necessarily have to build it themselves at the given grade level that they're at. You could show them things that use trigonometry before they get to the stage where they actually need to know it, just so that they're seeing the principles in action, for example. You can also have students review projects, so things that have been done. They can look at finished projects and try and learn from them. They can analyze them. You can get them to try and see what bugs are happening in a project and, and adapt those or talk about them, describe processes and so forth, and see that they can actually interpret code that they see. And of course, you can take projects and modify them and remix them. So this can be really useful uh, because there are a staggering number of projects already released on Scratch that people have created, chosen to share. And so you can search for any topic you can imagine. Chances are there's going to be at least a few dozen Scratch projects that deal with that. And so you can look at that as a great way to tackle whatever it is you want to deal with in your classroom. I want to talk about the food chain. Well, Go to Scratch, search food chain, you will find hundreds and hundreds of projects where people have already done that. And so you can look at those. Maybe you need to adapt them a little. You know, oh, that creature doesn't live in Canada. We'll just switch it over to something that does. And all of a sudden, you've got a project that you can show people in, in your classroom that really matches your, your context. Or you can have them take a project and make it their own. So here's an example of a, um, you know, uh, a biology demonstration. Here's a project about an animal. Here's an example of what you can do. Now you take it and make it about your favorite animal. And there you go. Now they have to go switch some uh, images around. They'll add in their own facts, etc., and they'll create their own sort of interactive diorama about it using Scratch. So lots of different ways we can use Scratch to do all kinds of cool things. 
So on this page, I've listed out an example for six different subjects. So here we have some fun little projects that you can take a look at to get some ideas of what you could do in your classrooms that you know other people have already done. So this first project in a math game in Scratch, um, it's basically, <laughs> I created it in like 10 minutes. Just as an example, math is obviously something that computers do really, really well. Uh, and so we can play around with math at a very low grade level here. If you just click the green flag on this, you're going to see Scratch Cat lists a number, Gobo lists a number. If you click Let's Multiply, it's going to ask you, what's the answer? Four times six. And so if we type in 24, I guess this is really small on your screen. Sorry. So there we go. Four by six, 24. I'll enter that as my answer. And I'm correct. Now, if you click on Scratch Cat or Gobo, they will randomly create a new number so that you can practice whatever number combination you want. Importantly, they don't change numbers automatically so that if you do get it wrong, uh, 13, it can tell you you're wrong and the numbers don't change so you can try again. So super simple, super bare bones little project here. It's, I don't know, 10 code blocks or something. Um, so you can see that, you know, you can make a little practice games. Here, we're not necessarily visualizing multiplication. It's not, you know, sort of a manipulative based uh, game, but it's a really great practice. So this is a way that we can, again, incorporate Scratch projects. This you could easily code in a classroom, no problem. It's it's very simple. But we can incorporate games and Scratch projects because they're interactive. We can have our students interact with them. So they can go and practice their multiplication for as much as they need to now. When they have that project, boy, you need to go get better at multiplication. Well, you don't have to generate multiplication sheets yourself. You know, you can just have this project and it will infinitely create multiplication for them to practice with. So there's an example of math. Of course, we can do all kinds of other things. This is multiply. You can easily change one code block and it'll be subtraction. One code block, it'll be addition, division, whatever you like. Super easy to do. And of course, you can make a slightly more complicated version with, you know, four different buttons, and then you could choose what operation you're doing, anything like that. With Canadian Animal, we've got uh, a version here of uh, KCJ activity they at least used to run um, called Canadian Animal. So you would make, you would choose a Canadian animal, and then you would make a presentation about it. What does it eat? What eats it? Where does it live? Stuff like that. So this is one of the uh, entries I made along with kids. And so they wanted me to make a walrus game. So I made Walrus Simulator 4000. And here we can learn all about walruses. And so you can see my lovely impromptu drawing of a walrus. And you know you can see it's in the Arctic. Uh, I drew a little clam here, and occasionally there's an octopus will show up, uh, so you can see that they eat those two things. Um, there's a polar bear to show their predation, uh, stuff like that. So there's different ways you can interact with the walrus, and you can discover those. Um, this project is not shared. Oh, I should probably share that. That'll make that a little easier for you guys to see. Uh, <laughs> So, and always, uh, there we go. So it's shared now. It should work for you. Sorry about that. Forgot to remember to share the slide, but not the uh, the actual projects. Um, in social studies, uh, a common project is to showcase a historic person. Uh, so in this case, I've got a project here written about Marie Curie. Um, I think this one might have been in French. Um, but there's, uh, in this 
project. I chose it particularly because there's both uh, visual and audio uh, components to it. Uh, lots of information uh, about her. Um, I figured French wouldn't be too much of a shock uh, for you people. You probably do get exposed to that a little bit uh, over there. Um, <laughs> so uh, obviously, you know, making an English version of it would be easy enough, but it's a good example of how you could tie in, well, basically anything. You know, this is about a personality. I've seen it done with, you know, write a report on countries or cultures whatever you like uh, and you know then you can have students incorporate information in dialogue in images uh, use the uh, uh, voice recorder to make audio files for things or use the AI text-to-speech feature so it can actually speak out your uh, your information stuff like that in language arts, uh, we've got an example of animated poetry. Uh, and of course, this is going to be the subject uh, we're going to dive into a bit more uh, later in our uh, workshop. We're going to get hands on with some uh, poetry. But here's an example of, you know, they've made a, a nice image and you'll see eventually the text fades in here uh, and you can see just some nice scrolling text. There's some music that goes along with it. Uh, I'm not sharing audio here uh, to make life a little easier, but uh, you can see they've added a number of different little animation effects. And so it's a, a nice way that really adds to poetry. You know, you've got the meaning of the poetry, but here we can use sound and visuals in order to sort of heighten the experience. What, what sort of mind space and mood do we want to create uh, in our viewer. And so I think it's a nice way that we can explore uh, the the emotional uh, meaning of poetry and and sort of explore theme and um, more artistic expression and and sort of dive into all those different aspects of poetry. So uh, you know, we've got lots of language arts uh, opportunities there. For art, uh, I'm sharing a really classic uh, kids programming example. So this is a project that draws different shapes. Uh, basically, uh, a real classic in uh, teaching coding is just getting kids to tell a computer how to draw different shapes. This one takes it way further and uh, shows how geometry can be beautiful. And so this creates an example pattern. If we crank the repeat down to just one, uh, we can actually see, ah, it's really just drawing a shape. And we can choose how many sides that shape has from three to 18. So, you know, we just want triangles. We can start with three. Now, what if we draw a lot more triangles? And that's where we start using the repeat. So we can draw two triangles. What does four triangles look like? What does an awful lot of triangles look like? Uh, and change their size. And it creates different patterns. So it's a neat way that we can sort of explore uh, concepts of symmetry and uh, geometric patterns. Uh, at a degree that we are not going to do by hand. <laughs> so um, it's it's a great way that we can, you know, tap into the potentials of digital tools um, because I certainly don't want to have to draw 30 different 18-sided uh, polygons in perfect harmony there uh, to create that pattern, but I'll gladly have a computer do it. So um, we can see really stunningly beautiful things uh, get created. And so this is a great artistic thing. Uh, in higher grades, you can also tie this into biology because we also see a lot of these patterns show up in nature uh, because of the mathematical nature of chemistry and, and biology. And lastly, I have a little example of even health class, 
we can incorporate coding into because uh, number one, you know, self-expression is a part of health curriculum uh, in general. I haven't read the Quebec uh, health curriculum, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be in there somewhere. Uh, and so self-expression is really important, but self-care is also super important. And those are two things that we can actually incorporate uh, coding into uh, relatively easily. And so in this case, we have a synced meditation uh, program here. And it's very simple. It's basically a breathing guide. And so it's try and time your breath with the animation. And so it can help students, you know, just have that moment of Zen, slow down their breath, just focus on, on the program. Uh, I believe there's some really nice music uh, playing along to this. Um, and so it's just a nice, simple way that we can get students to just be a little mindful and, and take those, those breathers uh, to relax. It does allow you to change the speed of the uh, breathing. So there's different settings that you can switch between. Uh, so I don't know, seems a little fast at some settings, uh, maybe a little too slow on others. Uh, but again, you could have your students play with those numbers to, to take this and just remix it. And you can play with those numbers how you like, or you can even just take it and re-theme it with different visuals. So, hey, maybe what, what calms you down? What's your favorite color? Well, choose that as the background, whatever it is. So just simple little ways that we can remix things and, and make it their own uh, so that you're, you're taking self-care and you're taking self-expression and self-identity into the picture. So some nice little examples that spread across the whole range of possibilities there. Now, in particular, today I wanted to talk about animated poetry. Uh, so we're going to do a little code along uh, project here. And so in the presentation, I've got a link to a starter project. So starter projects are a great way to do coding where you may have a slightly more complicated project that you want to get to, uh, but you don't want to make your students have to do absolutely every single step of that process. So here I've created a project that's going to give you some stuff you can work with to begin with, so you don't have to copy in all the lines of poetry, for example, and we're going to be able to just focus on the coding process, but you would easily be able to take this and remix it and add in your own choice of poem. Or you could have students, for example, choose their own poem and then do some of what we do today. So some different examples here. I've got a starter project that I'll get you all to join me uh, at. You can, you can go to the link and then you're gonna go up to the top right here and you're going to choose see inside uh, or there might be a remix button for you either of those will work um, but if you see inside we'll jump over to the editor and we can actually look inside this and do some coding now for this project uh, i'm using uh, amanda gorman's uh, the hill we climb uh, poem, which was uh, the poem recited at the Biden uh, inauguration in 2020. Uh, she's um, the youngest poet laureate of the United States uh, in history, and I think this particular poem is a stunning piece, uh, a wonderful tribute to the potential of America. Uh, Hopefully we can get uh, something just as beautiful written about Canada someday. Uh, this one came to mind fast and, and easy for me as an example. So uh, we'll stick with it. And I think there's a lot of certain commonalities uh, between it uh, to work with. So here we can see um, I've got already a number of objects uh, in the project. Uh, you can see there's frame animation, princess, scrolling, word blat, phrase blat, and phrase phase. Uh, 
uh, are our objects. And the backdrop has a couple different backdrops built into it. So we have a little title and a blank background. So I've just added those things in. So, you know, we don't have to start from scratch because there's a lot uh, that I kind of wanted to talk about or uh, show people. And so uh, if you just hit the green flag, you can see we've got the title for the poem there and a nice little frame animation. So the, um, the game starts, it automatically will switch you to the title screen and it will show that little frame animation that sort of highlights the, the hill we climb. It's a very obvious um, <laughs> illusion there. Uh, but I just wanted to give you an example of frame animation. So there are lots of different things that we may want to show to our students and get them to work with when we talk about poetry. There's uh, obviously the potential of all kinds of visuals when we're dealing with Scratch. It's a wonderfully visual platform. And so the biggest thing that's going to come up when you're talking about poetry is we could add visuals to it. Here we have text. Um, well, again, I'm using a professional written published poem. You could have the students, of course, write their own poems or choose one uh, that's already written. And then you can explore how do we want to present it to people? How do we want to enhance or explain the poem in some way. Obviously the walking animation, a little on the nose, but uh, we'll, we'll assume that uh, I could get a little more poetic if I was trying to aim for, for higher than, than grade school. Uh, but it's a really good example of frame animation here. I've just taken some of the internal pre-built art in Scratch with, um, one of the characters in the sprite library has a nice little walking cycle that we can bring to life. So here I've already written the code. Oh, I should switch over to high visibility for everybody, make life easier. And so we can see that I've created the code here. This is sort of a standard combination of frame animation and motion animation. I've got a trigger when the green flag is clicked. So this automatically starts when the program starts. I have the sprite start way off on the left-hand side. I tell it to show. I then repeat a change in position. So it's going to go across with the X change. It's going to go up a little with the Y change. And it changes next costume has a tiny little delay between the frames and then repeats 52 times so that it will last long enough for the character to go all the way across the screen. And then it hides that character, that sprite. So we get that nice little walk across animation uh, as a little example. Chances are your students are gonna wanna animate all kinds of little things. There's plenty of built-in art in Scratch to choose from, or they can create their own. This is just a nice little example for you on how to do a frame animation with motion. So I wanted to include that so you have a copy. Uh, and again, I'm just using Avery. That's the character's name. I just used the Avery walking built-in sprite, and you can see there's four separate images for a standard four frame walk cycle uh, classic animation. So that's just one example of a character that could help bring the poem to life. Now, another example is we could want an image to fade in and fade out, for example. This is again, a very common animation and a nice way that you can sort of highlight a concept as a line of poetry comes up. Oh, it's mentioning birds. 
I want birds to appear on the screen for a little bit and then go away after that, you know, stanza is done, we can we can get rid of the birds. So I'll give you another example of a really basic animation technique. And I'll get you to follow along with me. So we're going to start by going down to the choose a sprite button down here, the little happy cat face with a plus. We're going to click that. And this is going to allow us to use some of the pre-built art in Scratch. And for this, you could choose anything you like, but I'm going to scroll down here and I'm going to use the heart. So that will add the heart into our project. And what we're going to do is we need this heart to be able to fade in and out of visibility. So you can instantly turn things on and off like a light switch using the show and hide code blocks. I want to get a little more fancy and use fading in and out using the ghost property of a sprite. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to start in the events because you always got to start with an event so the computer knows when to do something. So we'll grab the when green flag clicked code block, the very first event. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tell my prod, my object to be invisible. So it's not going to start the project uh, as visible. I'm going to wait to tell it when I want to see it as a separate event. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the when space key pressed event as well, because I'm going to want to be able to trigger when I want this to be visual or not. So those are our two events. And what we're going to need is we're going to go up to the looks code blocks. And we can, to begin with, set color effect to zero. So this code block, I'm going to put in the green flag clicked, and I'm going to change it over from color to ghost. So this is going to set the visibility of our sprite. And if I start it at 100, I'm basically making something 100% invisible. So this will mean when we start the project, that heart is not going to be able to be found. And so if I click the green flag, we get the walking animation, but there is no heart. The heart starts invisible. And so what we want to do is be able to trigger having the heart become visible or not. So to do that, we're going to need the change color effect by 25. And we're going to change it to ghost. And here, if we changed it by 100, it would just instantly, or sorry, minus 100, it would just instantly turn from 100% invisible to 100% visible, which is not exactly a particularly smooth transition. So what we can do is we can change it by a smaller amount, like five, and either we would have to hit the space key 20 times to go from invisible to visible, or we can go down to control and stick our change into a repeat, which we can then get it to do it multiple times. So in a repeat 20, if we start the game, it'll start invisible. And if we hit the space key, it fades in really nice and smooth like that. So that works really nicely to make it a nice smooth transition. But of course, then it ends up stuck on visible. So what we can do is we can copy our repeat. And to do that, we're just going to take our mouse and we're going to right click on repeat. And you can see duplicate. And if we duplicate it, it's going to copy the repeat and anything inside or below it. 
So in this case, we get the repeat and the ghost effect, which means we can slap that underneath. And then if we change the second one to a positive change, we're going to do 20 sets of change ghost effect by five. And that's going to raise the ghost effect, making it go back invisible. So now when we start, it's invisible. We hit the space bar. It fades in and then fades out. Now it happens instantly. So it's a little brief, but you can always take a wait and stick that between your repeats. And then it'll stick around for a little while. So you get enough visibility out of it. So you can just hit the space, fades in, holds, fades out. So a really nice little animation effect that will help you, uh, you know, that can cover a lot of really important uses for having um, visuals to match your poetry. You want them visible for a little while, but not for very long, because of course you're moving on to the next line, the next stanza, etc. You're going to have all kinds of different visuals that you're going to want to cycle through. So those two are sort of your most basic little visuals you can add in to highlight visual aspects that tie in with the poetry. But what about the poetry instead? Well, we actually want to be able to make sure, one, we can show the words. Poetry without the words is a bit lacking. So uh, we do really want to have the words in there, but there's lots of things we can do with the words. So how do we want to present them? Well, in our first example, we're going to take a look at, we're going to go over to our princess object. And you're going to see I've got a little bit here to begin with. So I've already got a when green flag clicked hide so that you don't notice the princess when you start this project. But we're going to basically have the princess be a character that's presenting our poetry by reciting it. So we're going to have sort of a dialogue approach or a soliloquy approach to our poetry. And so this character can actually present the poem as a character. So to do that, what we'll do is we'll go over to events and we will grab a when space key pressed. And in this case, we've already got the space key doing something. So let's switch this to a different keystroke. And I'm going to go to the P for princess. And here you can see I have entered in a whole bunch of say blocks, each with a different line of the poem. So obviously, we're going to get the princess to say those things. but if you just connect those and you press P, you're not going to see much. And that's because the princess is hiding. If the princess is invisible, you don't see the princess or what she says. So we're going to change some visibility settings here. So if we go up to looks, we can scroll down and find the show and hide code blocks. So here we've already got the princess hiding. What we want to do is, of course, when the P is pressed, we're going to want to show the princess. And while we're here, we might as well also grab a hide because when she's done reciting the poem, we're going to get her to disappear so that we can go to other visuals because in this example project, we're going to show a few different ways we can show the poem. So we'll want the princess to disappear at some point. Now, you'd think that would be enough, but of course, we have that title on the screen. So that kind of distracts people from seeing the poem as we recite it. So we kind of want that title to disappear. And so we're going to use a different looks block while we're here. 
And we're going to go up and grab the switch backdrop to title block. And we're going to put that above our show. And we're just going to switch this over from title to BG or background. So that's going to get rid of the words on the background so that everything is just so much nice and clear. So we can hit the P now. And you'll see the princess here is going to recite the poem to you, or at least the stanza of the poem. Now, this ties in with another sort of meta goal we have with our classroom. Here we're dealing with poetry, we're dealing with code, but what we are also secretly sneaking in while the kids don't notice, reading. The kids need to have a level of reading comprehension that matches the timing. Now, we don't want to punish our students by having timing that's too tight, but they will notice that the faster they can read, the easier it is to enjoy this. And they're going to find that's true with subtitles and everything everywhere throughout the rest of their lives. So it's this subtle little push to help kids understand that reading comprehension and reading speed actually help them enjoy things. And so you don't have to ever have to say anything about this. It's just a wonderful way that they start playing with it because they're going to be there typing in those numbers. And some kids are going to type shorter numbers than others, and they're going to realize that and get that social reinforcement to be a better reader. So while we're focused on poetry or coding or both in this, we also are incorporating other concerns in education subtly and secretly into this. Uh, so again, by working with multimedia and interactivity, we do end up sort of playing with concepts and, and introducing subtle pressures for growth in ways that we might not even explicitly be recognizing. Now, you can also, you may have noticed that the princess disappears a little quickly. If you want, you can always add in some weights, say at the end, for example, before she disappears. You could add in a little weight. You could put in pauses between the lines, whatever you like. Another great thing that we're exploring by doing this is the concept of cadence right? How do you read a poem? We're exploring timing and the division of lines or sentences as a way that we actually influence the feeling and the interpretation of poetry. And so, again, we can play at more depth with poetry than you might have thought um, that, that cadence and, and sentence structure and stanzas can actually be discussed as a part of this audio-visual presentation of poetry. And so there are a few other examples in here of how we can present poetry to the user. So if you go to the scrolling object, you're going to see there's no code in here yet, but I'm going to show you a really crazy way that we can get scrolling text on our screen. If you go over to the costumes for scrolling, you're going to see costume one is empty, and costume two actually has a stanza of the poem written in there as a single object, as, as text in the costume. Now, why we've done it like this, there's this tiny bit of code or tiny bit of text here, and there's a blank costume, is one, it means that when we start our project, the scrolling text doesn't show up because it's a blank costume. So that helps. Uh, we don't have too many different things going on all at the same time, which is nice. But we're actually going to play with kind of a rule-breaking technique in our code here. So I really wanted to show this. We'll just squeak this in here. Um, 
And what we're going to do is we're going to use those two costumes so that we can show a bit of text that'll scroll from off screen across the screen to off screen again. And Scratch really doesn't like things being off screen. It generally prevents that from happening. Here, we're doing a tricky little workaround that will allow us to do that. So we're going to, I'm going to maybe rush this more than I had intended, uh, just because of the time. But uh, we're going to start here with a couple events. We're going to grab a when green flag clicked. And we are going to grab a when space key pressed. And we're going to change space key over to an S for scrolling. So there we go. Now, what we need to do is one, we need to make sure our project starts the right way, right? When green flag is clicked, we want to make sure our poetry is invisible so that it's not covering up our title screen. And so we're going to go over to looks and we're going to grab a few things here. One, we want to make sure the backdrop starts at the title. So this is just going to reinforce that it's starting the right way. If you end up deleting some of the other options, this option will work all on its own together. We're going to switch the costume. So like I said, there's two costumes, the blank one and the actual poetry. We're going to make sure it starts on the blank version. And here we're going to do something really weird. We're going to set size to 200% because that text was kind of small. So we're going to make this, the text a little bigger than it was in the costume. And just as a backup, we're also going to hide it. Now, if it's costume one, it will be invisible. There's nothing there to see, but I'm going to hide it anyways, just because it's good practice or to sort of control the hide and show. Um, and we're going to show it uh, later. And you may want to include that fade in, fade out concept or other effects like that. So I'm just going to throw hide in there just as sort of a, a good habit. Now, when we want the scrolling poetry to happen, we're going to need to change those backdrops and costumes again, right? So we're going to start by switching the backdrop to BG instead of titles. The title's going to go away and it won't overlap with our poetry. We're going to need to switch the costume to costume two so that we can actually see the poem. We're going to need to show it. And importantly, we're going to need to position it because it's going to be moving because of the scrolling effect. We want to make sure that it starts way down at the bottom. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go to X, Y, and we're going to have X zero and Y as like minus 300. So that's going to make sure that the poetry is off screen downward. So minus 180 is the very bottom of the screen. If you put it at minus 300, it's completely off screen. So then to animate it, we're just going to need a repeat. And we're going to change this to like repeat a thousand because it's going to need to go from way off screen on one side to way off screen on the other side. And it's tall, so we'll just give it a giant number. And inside the repeat, all we need is a change Y by one. And it's going to allow it to slowly float up. Now, the reason, and we can click the green flag here to, to start a project here. We can test it out. There we go. And we can hit S. And you're going to see scrolling text. So it's not quite at the, uh, you know, we don't have the fancy angle like Star Trek or Star Wars uh, text to fly over the galaxy. That'd take another half hour to 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 fit in here, uh, but 
We have scrolling text, useful for all kinds of things. The reason it works is this sneaky little thing in the costumes. In general, you won't be able to push something off screen unless you have, oops, the text tool, a sneaky invisible object. So if you use the arrow key in costume two, you're gonna see, oh yeah, there's the text, really nice. If you tried doing this and only had the text there, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't allow your text to be off screen or to scroll off screen. But what we did is if you select an area with your mouse, you're gonna see there's this giant rectangle that goes right from the very top to the very bottom of the canvas. And it has a fill of transparent and an outline of transparent. And what this does, it's a very sneaky little move here. Your costume has to remain on screen at all times in Scratch. It won't allow you to move an object so its costume is off screen. But if its costume is invisible, the costume can still be on screen without you seeing anything. So to us, it's off screen, but to Scratch, it's still on screen. So it's a sneaky little move that you need to do for cool little visual effects like this. So there's an example of some scrolling text. I have two other examples, but we didn't have time to, to work through them. But if you go to the presentation here, you'll see in the next page, we actually have a link to the finished project. And so this will include all the coding we did today and a couple little extra little things here that I'm gonna show you. A couple other options for how you can present poetry uh, at least easily uh, in Scratch. And there's always more complex options, <laughs> but uh, I wanted to give you a few little options here that show you uh, one, some really good descriptions here using comments. But if we go to our word blap, uh, is my name for this, you can start the project. And this one, you'll hit the Z button to try it out. And what you'll see is it simply blats in one word at a time for this poem. And all it is, is it's actually just a frame animation. You can see it's just repeat next costume. And what I did is the costumes take this big poem and they basically erase one word at a time. And then I reverse the order so that when you go through the next costume, next costume, next costume, it's basically just adding one word. The easiest way to do it is to write it all and then erase stuff. So you can do it by typing in new words, but you'll find that alignment will be very hard to manage. So it's better to just write it all and then just erase some of it. Uh, another one is the phrase blap, which actually takes each line in the poem and has a separate costume for it. So that, uh, what? letter was this a you hit a oh of course the other one is now visible you can see that it just switches one line after one line after one line and you can play with the timing here to deal with you know cadence you can allow this to sort of give a focus to one line so that as it mentions the globe, you could put in, you know, a picture of the earth or something like that, and you can make it more visual. So there's lots of ways that we can play with things like this to highlight poetry, to tie in visuals, uh, stuff like that. Uh, the last one there was a uh, phrase phase, which does the same thing. It just adds that fade in, fade out effect to the, to the individual lines as they're presented. So lots of different options of ways we can play with words, bring them to life, and we can start exploring other meanings and, and ideas around poetry, cadence, 
imagery that it's evoking. We can have students deal with, you know, reading comprehension by having them put imagery that matches the meaning of the poem, stuff like that. So. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> I love those effects, uh, I, I mean, it's just, wow. And what, what are you sharing with us here? What is? So I've got uh, a few little links at the back end here. Uh, Teacher's Guide to Scratch is a little website I've got that covers the books and my online courses. Uh, you can check out my company, massivecorp.ca, for other stuff that I do. Uh, I just launched a game, a uh, free online educational game about jurisdictions and the levels of government in Canada. So if you happen to need to teach um, anything about constitutionality, levels of government, division of power, etc., uh, I just made a, a game to help teach people about that, uh, either students or adults. Uh, or politicians um, may all benefit from that. But uh, I think that's all we that's have great. time for today. Yep, yep, that is great. I, can... I mean, just some of the simple concepts too, Kai, that you, sh you know, we got to see. I mean, you can see how this could apply to like anything, right? Like content wise, so. That was really cool. Yeah, that's the thing. The more techniques you learn with coding, the more you're going to be able to borrow those to do all kinds of stuff. So, you know, when you learn to do the timing with the poetry, oh, that would also really help with doing a little diorama scene. So I can make sure my little dinosaur walks onto the screen and gets eaten by the T-Rex or whatever it is. It it all adds together. The more The more you do with coding, the more tools you have in your tool set to tackle anything. Absolutely. Well, thanks for empowering us and building our toolkit up. Um, I'm sending a book to each of you guys that attended. So Eleanor, Lucas, and David, you're going to get a book. Uh, we're sending it to you via, it'll come via Amazon. So you don't have to do anything. Just look out for it. It'll be coming. Um, and We'll send you the beginner one because it really gives kinds of these kinds of techniques as well of how to like, you know, create some cool functionings that can happen. So congratulations. <laughs> and kind yeah. of again, I want to thank you. That was just really cool. There's so many cool uh, ideas and stuff. And I love that idea of creating a, a piece of the project and then letting the kids kind of figure the rest out, which is really cool. So thanks for yeah. that. Yeah, and it's great, you know, we can take a poem that we know and we like and we want to highlight, or we can have kids create their own or choose yeah. their own poems. And so you can explore all kinds of things like that and, uh, and yeah, just open it up and yeah. um, buy like the one. voice idea too that you had said too, like, it's always so hard to stand up in front of a class and like recite <laughs> something or present like, boom, you could like just put all your voice right in here and kids could go and look at it individually rather than the torture of standing up in front of the class so <laughs> yeah, <Awesome. laughs> yeah but we can all right, guys, have well, explore all those other aspects of poetry as well so absolutely absolutely so thank you there is another session next tuesday as well where we're going to up the notch a little bit more um and if you guys want to come back you could win the second book <laughs> awesome so thanks like, like thanks the whole all set. for coming <laughs> <laughs> and kai awesome and uh well we'll see you guys uh we'll see you next tuesday cool have a great uh evening guys bye <laughs> <laughs> yep. thanks for having me everybody cheers